Welcome back to another episode of Empire. I swear I say this on every episode, but we've got a really special guest. Super excited for this. You probably know him from the show, Shark Tank, but he's done a million other things. Uh, an operator, an investor, and just someone who's been at the forefront of technology for the last couple of decades. We have Kevin O'Leary. Mr. Wonderful, welcome to the show, my friend. Thank you. Great to be here. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Great to have you here. You are one of the only people who could get me to not wear a hoodie or a t-shirt to the show. I throw on a button down and, <laughs> and a sweater for you and you're not even in the suit and tie. So, uh, I want to talk about just the current business cycle and the macro landscape right now. It's been an insane last couple of months and really last probably two years in the kind of the more global macro cycle, right? And right today we're sitting here, we've got inflation, Fed's about to hike, it's getting more expensive to borrow. Really anyone you listen to, I was listening to uh, Jason Kalkanis and Chamath's podcast over the weekend, everyone is saying hard times are coming, right? Batten down the hatches. So I want to get your take on this. Do you agree with these guys? Is it batten down the hatches time? No, I don't agree with them. So the market's building in eight Fed hikes, 25 basis points at a time. I don't think that happens. Um, right now, we've got a lot of uh, uncertainty in the market. You've got the Russian-Ukraine thing. Uh, you have this pandemic, uh, you know, COVID cases. I'm here in Manhattan. I think we're up 80% last week. Everybody's getting COVID again. But because so many people are vaxxed, it's not traumatic, as traumatic an outcome. But still, it's on the uh, uh, nerves investors to see people locked down in Shanghai. All that's coming. But, you know... I think the Fed is is posing with a, a strong stick, but a lot of the um, inflationary concerns, and let me give you the measures that I look at. I've got investments in like 36 private companies from, from insecticide, commercial kitchens, companies that service wireless charging. I'm all over the map and, all, and they're private. So I get the tear sheets of the sales every week. I see zero slowdown right now. We can't even hire people. So if someone's going to see inflation or, a, or at least a recession first, it's going to be me. And I don't see it yet. But the reason I say that is I look at spot pricing of trucking. So you remember uh, 90 days ago, we were up like 30% in spot trucking to get you get your product or service from LA to uh, New York, You know, just to buy any kind of transportation. Those prices have collapsed 35%. So truckers are back at work. Things are looking much better. Uh, inflation, I think, is a transitory element, at least 50% of it. So I'm not as bearish as the pundits are, and I'm investing accordingly. Because right now, with a two and change 10-year and inflation at call at six, I would never buy that bond. That's stupid. You're going to get slaughtered on that. I think it's better to stay the course on equities with your pricing power in large corporations. And that's my strategy. You know, in inflationary times, and you can go back through three cycles of inflation, companies that have pricing power, that have positive business models and less debt on their balance sheet generally perform very well because they can pass on their costs to investors and to clients that are buying their services and goods. And so you, I prefer to have that than the bonds in the same company because I know with it, 100% you know, outcome, what I'm going to get paid back and when. If I have a long duration bond and inflation is six and I'm paying 3.2%, which is sort of the average of corporate paper right now, that's a really bad place to put capital to work. So I'd much rather go in, in equities. And you, know, you, you have to kind of take a position um, in looking at, at, at equities that very often the best time to invest is when Everybody's going the other way, the lemming effect, you know, the penguins going off the cliff model. Tech has been cut in half, and yet the growth rates of the companies have not slowed at all. There's no evidence that growth rates have slowed in mega cap internet giants. Zero, even the Chinese companies. But the prices have been cut in half because everybody's got concerns for whatever reason they've got. So I'm an investor. I mean, you know, I look at the most hated Chinese companies, and I understand why everybody hates them. It's a really bad zip code right now. But Tencent and Alibaba, my goodness. <laughs> like, you know, I, I bought those things three Mondays ago when some analysts called them uninvestable in, uh, in the U.S., and they're up 32%, even in a crappy market. 
So I'm sorry. I look at growth. I look at free cash flow. I look at balance sheet. I don't listen to people talking. I look at cash flow. That's what matters. I'm curious how you think about like investing in something like crypto and in your journey. At what point did you become interested? Uh, because a lot of these crypto companies don't have cash flow. I mean, you can look at Bitcoin miners and, and, and a few other publicly traded companies that might have cash flow. But I'm curious how you think about uh, investing in that framework. Well, I think miners, separate topic, okay? That's infrastructure play in crypto. We'll talk about that separately. Let's talk about the blockchain and coins, Big Daddy being uh, Bitcoin. So I don't think Bitcoin is a coin. I think it's software. I think Ethereum software, Polygon software, HBAR software, uh, any of these projects, you know, from Helium, Avalanche, all software. And the only reason they'll survive long term is they bring some kind of economic value to the table. So give me Polygon, which I just took an investment in on Sandeep's last deal. Basically says, look, let's aggregate transactions and push them through Ethereum at one transaction, cut gas fees by a huge amount, which works in India. Well, why wouldn't I invest in that? That's a great idea. I mean, there's real economic value there. Uh, same with helium, if it's going to change telco. I like that idea. Uh, Solona, is it going to speed up blockchain? Well, Sam Bankman Fried says, yes, why not put a 5% allocation into that? I don't know who's going to win. I got 32 positions. I only need two of them to work, and I've made a shitload of money. So it, it doesn't, I look at it in the nascent days of the internet in the 90s. Um, yeah, some of these are going to be pets.com, but others are going to bring tremendous value and be the Googles and the Microsofts of their generation. The whole idea that crypto is worthless, that's stupid. It's here to stay. And the only reason it's here to stay is I can, I just a couple of weeks ago told a, an international speaking agency that wanted to hire me in a country I'll leave nameless. They wanted to ACH me, the, the foreign currency transferred in the U.S. dollars. It was going to take three weeks. I said, never going to do it. Just pay me in USDC. If you can do that, I'll do the deal. And I was able to pay the agents, every all the expenses, everything in one second. So why wouldn't stablecoin be a long-term great payment system for everybody? If I'm using it now and I have to, you know, push back on people saying, well, I can't do that. I said, well, then I can't come and speak. You pay me USDC or give me another stable coin. I don't care which one. That way I can just put it through my account and pay everybody in, in two seconds. So that's why I know that's going to stay. Plus, you've got bills coming from senators and yada, 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 yada. Look, there's value in these protocols. They're just software. When you think about um, the investing in crypto, there's still, do you think we're in the early, like in the 1990s, um, where we have, you know, stable coins are getting a lot of adoption that could be maybe analogous to like the, e you know, the email moment of crypto where you see a lot of utility, but where do you think we are in the cycle of adoption where it comes to crypto? And do you think we're in the super early nineties and the eighties, uh, post dot com crash? I'm curious what your view is. We're nowhere in the adoption. The truth is that there's no foreign sovereign funds. There's no uh, institutional capital. We're nowhere. We're nowhere. We're nothing. I mean, everybody's excited about Bitcoin. The fact is, you know, sovereign funds globally, which have most of the capital and pension plans, U.S. stateside, zero, nothing. So for all the excitement, um, we got a long way to go. And they're never going to invest in it until we get policy and we get regulated. And that's the whole investment thesis. The whole idea is you're getting ahead of the institution here. If you believe that it has economic value and you put a portfolio together, you're going to get in long before a trillion dollars worth of, of capital comes in this market. Bitcoin itself is not a trillion dollars. That's nothing. It's nothing in the constants of financial assets. The whole market, three trillion, that's nothing. I know it sounds like a big number, nothing. It's nothing. You compare it to real estate or even gold, nothing. And so the, that's why the, there's an opportunity here. And, you know, you don't have to be a crypto cowboy. You have to think methodically. If there's real economic value, you position yourself now. And I suggest here's how you do it. I make the assumption, I could be wrong, but in the next 12, 10, 12 years, 
crypto will be the 12th sector of the S&P. There's 11 sectors. If you look at how a sovereign fund or pension plan manages capital, let's say they have $100 billion. That's the world I work in. They allocate up to 20% in any one sector and up to 5% in any one name. So if you're really bullish, like I am on crypto, you put 20% of the operating company's capital into crypto and no more than 5% into any one coin, token, blockchain, or level two, whatever you want to call it. And that's what I've done. I got 32 positions. I got 20% of the capital tied up. It's volatile as hell, but I'm okay with it because I make the assumption at some point, all of this policy that's being proposed will be adopted and then Katie bar the doors. Then we'll have a real asset. We'll have, you know, I, I know it's really trite to say, oh, Bitcoin's less than a trillion. A trillion dollars is dog shit in the institutional world. It's nothing. 10 years from now, is crypto the number one, the biggest sector in the S&P? Is it number two behind financials? Where does it actually stand? Actually, it transforms financials. The whole theory, I mean, you got to remember something. Financial services and FX, currency trading, itself is the largest sector and always has been globally forever. There's no market bigger than currency FX trading. And currency FX trading is a really bad, inefficient, crappy market. Let's say and I do this, let's say I'm, I'm, I've got a European ETF index. And I want, and if you think at Europe, you've got Swiss franc, you've got Euro, you've got British pounds. So I want to buy Nestle on the Zurich exchange. I have to take USDC, send it to some scumbag FX trader who clips me for three basis points for no value added whatsoever, zero value, don't need them, except I'm forced to do it. Then I buy my Nestle stock in Swiss francs, I hold it till I want to sell it. Then I get the same scumbag on the way back for three to eight basis points. I'm back in US dollars. I get clipped for eight to 10% or eight, eight to 10 basis points. Zero value. How much would I like to screw that guy by just getting a USDC or some other standard one of a, you know, just one standard stable coin that I can go, come in and out, come in and out, clip me for one or two basis points. I'm okay. I can't wait to screw over FX traders. And the only way we're going to do that is with the blockchain, with a full transparent audit of every transaction. And so I don't care which stable coin it is. We need to get that done to stop getting screwed by this incredible inefficiency in the currency market. And that's just one use case. That's only one use case. Multi-trillion dollar monthly market that could be man man you know, huge change by crypto. So that's why I'm a believer in it. That's why it will definitely be the 12th sector, if not the largest sector. There's so much friction and inefficiency and opaqueness and just scumbags in the middle, scraping bips out of the whole system that can be eradicated. You know, I don't care if they all shine shoes. We got to get rid of them. <laughs> Kevin, tell me how you really feel about a uh, middleman clipping bips. <laughs> well, there you have it. If you can add value, I'll pay you. When you add zero value and you only clip me because you're in the middle, I can't wait to screw you over. Yeah. What, what's the end state of these stable coins? Is it something like a USDC where it's a crypt, it's crypto, but it's, you know, has a like fiat as collateral? Is it something like a US CBDC? Is it something like what Terra is working on with UST? What is the end state for these stables? I think the end state is to ask the government to innovate on digital currency is a really bad idea. That's not what they do well. I think they regulate well. I think they provide policy well. I think it's better to let the private sector innovate technology like Circle has done, like Tether has done, like many others that could get licensed. Let there be 10 stable coins and let them all compete. No different than a Fidelity versus a Schwab on a money market, whatever. And so that I as an investor could look at the different attributes of each stable coin and say, all right, I'll put 30% into Circle, 30% into Tether, 30% into whatever. As long as we have a level playing field, on policy and regulation, transparency and audit. Because if I can maybe get 4.2% on a 90 day on circle lend, which I'm doing right now, and I can get maybe 4.4% on some other stable coin, I'll just do a basket of them. That's fine, let the market be the competitive about features and service. If you look at circle, their platform has gotten better and better in the last 90 days. I'd like to take some credit for the treasury tab because my own uh, auditors and compliance department forced that they needed to see every single transaction and every amount of interest on every contract. I'm not sure I'm the only guy that was complaining about that, but they fixed it. Now they got it. So innovation is coming. I wouldn't expect the government to deliver that. I don't want government writing code, 
really bad idea. Let's get them delivering policy and let's let the private sector write the code. That's what would be much better. Kevin, over the years, uh, I remember watching you on, on Truck Tank. You always struck me as very, very honest and pragmatic and, um, and you cut to the chase. Um, you've been skeptical about crypto before. Um, I'm curious, like, what was the aha moment for you? Like, at what point did you change your mindset and decided to invest um, so heavily in the space? Regulators. I started, you know, I, I started in 2017 with a position in um, ETH and, block, and, and Bitcoin. And um, boy, was that a toxic environment with the regulators because I had so many investments. I was even the chairman of an ETF company. And so I couldn't be offside on that. Um, and my own lawyer said, stay out of this and we don't want you talking about it. Uh, there's a lot of Wells letters going out. But that slowly changed. In let, Let's take, for example, the most progressive uh, market right now is Canada. They were the first to license uh, the first, um, you know, ex crypto exchange with a dealer broker attached to it. That was an order out of the OSC, the regulator there. Uh, that was a company called BitBuy. I know it well because uh, we bought it last week uh, in our company called WonderFi, which is also traded in Canada, where the regulator is very Um I, I, you know, uh, WonderFi has an investment thesis that they're going to roll up crypto exchanges around jurisdictions in the world that are licensing them, like the United Arab Emirates and other countries, because that's the infrastructure of crypto uh, trans, you know, crypto liquidity is exchanges. The great thing about an exchange is you don't care what the price of Bitcoin is. You get your basis points on every transaction. That's the investment thesis. But the regulator in Canada went first. They allowed the first Bitcoin ETF and the very first Ethereum ETF. Then you saw the United Arab Emirates. Then you saw the Swiss. Then you saw England. And you, all of these markets started to open up to crypto. And I said to myself, wait a second. Does that mean I've got to go invest in these other geographies to get ahead of the curve here, which is what I had to do. I had to go to Canada, I had to go to UAE, I had to go to Switzerland. And, and you know, on a, on a fully disclosed basis and make investments on those geographies in those local currencies, sometimes in U.S. dollar, whatever it was. And because the regulator became accommodative, it starts to tell you that policy is moving in the direction of adopting crypto. But nothing has been more accelerated than the last six weeks, including Bitcoin 2022 last week, with all of those politicians. Senator Cynthia Lummis herself showed up on Friday with a huge keynote on policy, 600-page uh, bill. And I'm not, I think she'll table it in three different pieces, but it contemplates everything except NFTs. you gotta, you got to take that in a very positive light. How do you manage timing as an investor? Um, and or are you just saying, look, I'm going to I'm comfortable holding this for the next 10, 15 years and I'm not going to even try to time markets. I'm going to invest mostly in private companies. Um, the, the issue with crypto is you can have liquid tokens. And so it's difficult to maybe stomach volatility for some people. Uh, but how do you do it? You can't manage timing. You can't time the S&P. You can't time crypto investments. You got to go long and you got to be diversified. I mean, I have so many positions. I don't know what's going to work. I don't, and you can't know. Um, you either believe in the metric and, and the protocol of productivity around financial services. You don't. I'm a believer. Um, but I also own some very speculative stuff like Pothereum. Pothereum is, you know, cats. And why would I invest in that? Because I'm big in cat DNA development and Pothereum gives back to, to, to shelters for animals. I mean, that's like, where's that going? Who knows? But I own a bunch of it because I want to be supportive of animal shelters. I, it's a way I can do it on a very democratized way. But that's not exactly economic uh, you know, productivity enhancement. That's just a cause and a movement, which also can be accommodated by tokens and coins. And then I'm very big in watch collecting. We talked about that earlier. So I'm on a very big protocol to write the white paper for uh, watch NFTs for authentication and insurance, not even trading the NFTs, just providing authentication so you can ensure the portion of your watch portfolio that you're wearing and the rest that are in a safe, you don't have to insure. You can do that with an NFT. In the watch industry, the secondary market is 12x the primary market. It's billions. You need an NFT for that. So all of these are protocols that I'm invested in because I live them daily. 
I think um, watches, uh, there was a time when like the Apple watch came out and everyone was saying the watch industry is dead. <laughs> There's been this kind of resurgence and I, and I become a watch collector myself, uh, uh, a, a minnow, if, if you call it that. Um, but what I find interesting is that there is this idea of differentiating. When everyone can have uh, an Apple watch, you want to go back to creating an identity and in, in, and I'm go, where I'm going with this is the the market of NFTs. I think a lot of people have become very interested in them. They might not even care about crypto, but people love collecting. People love differentiating. And I think NFTs are the are this idea to create a digital identity. Uh, I'm curious to get your thoughts on NFTs. If you like them, if you collect them, what you think that is doing to the overall crypto market? I do like NFTs. I'm a little worried about the regulator because. If an NFT has utility, in other words, it pays a free ticket to the Formula One race or it pays interest or a royalty back to its minter, that smells like a security to me. It really does, like a stock that pays a dividend. And I don't think I want to get involved in that while the regulator decides what they're going to do. If an NFT is a piece of art and it's not going to pay anybody anything, um, and it's just something you're collecting. I feel much more comfortable with that. If it's a, it's a, if it's a digital authentication certificate, I'm very comfortable with that. You know, there's many different iterations, but I agree with you. I think the NFT market in the long run will be bigger, bigger than cryptocurrencies because it will authenticate physical assets, which is a massive multi-trillion dollar market, whether it be real estate or jewelry or watches or cars or whatever, or con insurance contract. The blockchain is just too valuable for its transparent way of keeping track of what occurs. I mean, HBAR is really being contemplated by Boeing and supply chain management. Why wouldn't you want to own a piece of that? I mean, that's a really interesting idea to keep a ledger of what's going on on supply chain. So there's all of these ideas that involve tokens, NFTs, and digitization, but we're not even in the first inning yet, and we do need regulation to bring the spigot of institutional capital into the game, which isn't here yet. So that kind of matters. And I, and I think you got to keep your eye on all this stuff as it moves forward, not knowing what's going to work. There are a lot of investors, kind of maybe older school, traditional capital markets investors, who when they hear about crypto, they get excited about things like tokenizing real estate, maybe, or attaching an NFT to a piece of art, right, that usually just sits in custody. Does that feel like an antiquated kind of framework for crypto? Or is, you know, attaching digital uh, utility to physical things, or is it all, and or is it all about uh, just like digitally native things? So, like, are bored apes the most exciting thing about NFTs, or is it all about attaching NFTs to physical artwork? Does that make sense? I think you have all all use cases. I, I don't find bored apes as a good investment because you can have unlimited bored apes. But if you're if you are fractionalizing a Liechtenstein, which is happening right now uh, as we speak on Start Engine. It's controversial in the art world, but it's very successful. Nobody can afford a full Liechtenstein, but if you can get a fraction of it and appreciates in value 12% a year, you'll get your fractional increase. And that's what's going on. And I have to disclose I'm a shareholder in uh, Start Engine and a paid spokesperson. I remember when Howard Marks, the founder, called me and said, we're going to fractionalize a uh, Andy Warhol, and then we're going to do a Liechtenstein. I said, wow, that's just, that's different. I wonder how their art world's going to take that one on. And it was a, it was, <laughs> I mean, it got a lot of press, I'll tell you that, but it was very successful. So I think new ideas of digitization using NFTs and fractionalized ownership. I mean, the market decides, right? It doesn't matter what any of us think. It, it's the market decides. I may agree. I may not agree, but the market decides. That's what matters. Yeah. Um, all right, I want to go back to a couple of your investments, Kevin. You mentioned all right, twenty percent of your portfolio is now in crypto. You talk about uh, software investing as kind of like your framework for how you're investing in crypto. One thing that's different, though, in software investing is you have these like you have these really high um, it, it, uh, high LTVs and high customer acquisition costs. In crypto, there are no switching costs, and that's a lot different than something like. Uh, something like software, right? If you look at something like DeFi, it's really, really easy for a user to just bounce around these different DeFi platforms in Web2 and in software. Once you're kind of in, you're in. You don't really move platforms. Does this change your framework for how you view these investments? It does, and I think you brought up a very important question. If you believe, and as I do, that slowly um, 
regulation brings capital. So I don't look at regulation as a negative. I look at it as a positive. And so as we've got such a small amount of people, even just domestically using crypto, around 16% and even less using NFTs yet, the majority of the market hasn't voted yet because they're concerned about security and they don't understand how it works and they can't use decentralized or centralized wallet easily. So here's my thinking. I believe that when things get easier, particularly decentralized wallets, now let's talk about the merits. A decentralized wallet, you actually own your coin. A centralized wallet, you're trading on a pool of value of your coin. You have a fractional ownership. But maybe you could argue it's a little more secure and you actually have a one 800 Hi, what happened to my coin person to talk to? You don't have that on the decentralized wallet. So every all these companies running around trying to acquire customers, as you say, people are very transient because it's so easy to be transient. But most people who have to go through a regulated gauntlet where they have to fill out all the know your customer stuff and register and attach their bank account to do, you know, a transfer of capital to get fiat into buying ETH and then onwards. That's a lot of work. And so if you're able to capture that customer, you better have both a centralized wallet and a decentralized wallet. Because maybe I'm going to hold my, you know, as you mentioned earlier, my larger amount of capital in my centralized wallet across maybe four or five coins. And then I want to mess around in the NFT market. And I want that decentralized where I own my own NFT in my wallet. So there are companies now, and Wonderfy is one of them, it's up in Canada, it's public, that have done both. They've said, wait a second, we're cost- it's costing so much to acquire a customer. Let's do one know your customer form and give you access to both centralized, decentralized. That's where I think we're going. I think that's where we're going, where people start to harbor themselves in one platform, getting the merits of both. Lower gas fees on decentralized, direct ownership on decentralized, and then a little more rock solid tax reporting on their coin trading on centralized wallet. So I think three years from now, 36 months from now, that's what you're going to see. Now, a lot of these, uh, you know, platforms like the big guys, Binance and and FTX, well, they're going to go to places where they can get licenses. And for me, FTX is a little better because it's got better compliance uh, for your compliance department in terms of reporting, um, which I need, you know, I'm put it in a corporate setting. I have to have a compliance department and an auditor to look at my mark to market every day. And I've got all those positions. One push a button and boom, out comes the report. Well, you need that. And so I think the world matures. And I think these, I think the players that are figuring out how to adopt. And the one big opportunity for me is around exchanges. If, if countries licensing an exchange, there's so many that haven't even started yet. I mean, a real license, a banking license, like a Brazil, I'm a buyer. I'll buy it. That's like buying the NYSC 200 years ago. That's the way I look yeah. at it. Yeah. What about clean energy mining? I've heard you talk a bit about that. Yeah. So you've really uh, walked into a uh, minefield on that one. Let's talk about what's happened in the last three years in Bitcoin mining. As we all know, the majority of Bitcoin was mined in China, not ethically or not sustainably. They burned a lot of carbon burned a lot of coal, made coin, got awarded coin. And the majority of coin trading today are those. Now, no one cared back then, and that's fair, but today they do. And Bitcoin mining has got a really bad rap in the last 12 months around the amount of energy that it burns to get a coin awarded. So... Let's just walk through what's happened in the last three months on Bitcoin mining, just on policy. Number one, Senator Loomis's bill being developed around all crypto, including Bitcoin. Number two, Biden's executive order, specific paragraph on the back end of the order, climate change, direct swipe at Bitcoin mining. Then you got the BlackRock edict, Larry Fink's letter, third letter around dirty Bitcoin mining, extremely negative. But the most concerning for me is the SEC memo that says, wait a second, everybody, 
I mean, I'm interpreting what it says, but it says, we know carbon credits are bullshit and we're going to audit you. So every domestic Bitcoin miner is saying, I'm carbon neutral because I bought some offsets. You know, it's complete BS. The, the tracking error on carbon audits is is so wide that when the SEC says it needs to be audited like your financial statements on every quarter, you're going to need to get your auditor to sign that. And they're never going to do it. Never. They're not going to take on the liability of the SEC order to prove that you're carbon neutral. Zero probability that happens. So here's my thesis. Institutional capital and sovereign wealth for the last three years have been indexing the big miners. Marathon, Hot 8, Hive, Riot. All you have to do is own those stocks, U.S. domestic stocks, and they traded in parity with Bitcoin pricing. Perfect. No problem. And even I did that. The minute I read that SEC memo, I sold all of it. Because not that I want to see great companies get screwed. They're screwed. Because nobody's going to sign those audits for them. And they're, and they're going to be in this horrible position trying to prove that they are carbon neutral. So the new model Capital immediately moves to the new model. I call it the Norway model. Here's the Norway model. There is a facility being built in Norway by a company called BitZero. And yes, I'm an investor in that. But who's the largest shareholder? Investors out of the United Arab Emirates. Every single bit main on that platform, they're building up to 300 megawatts, is excess hydroelectricity in a village of 3,000 people that are stakeholders in the build out. So that water was going over the dam, not being used. Now it's being, it's being used to mine Bitcoin. Every coin that's awarded stays on the balance sheet of the private company. So the shareholders benefit from the awards. They've also got technology that takes out the network award, which is everybody knows you can't trace it back. So that's what's called the slag. It could be China. It could be Iran, Iraq. You don't know. They sell that off. So the, the coin that stays is pure hydro provenance. No problem there. Plus, they're providing to the university in northern Norway excess capacity for the whole data center. And all the heat coming out the stacks is providing a hydroponics facility for tomatoes and a canning plant beside it. Now, that's sustainable mining. So the only way this goes forward is you're going to have to invest, and I'm doing the same thing, finding these private companies that are doing hydro, nuclear power, and you're going to find that where? In Quebec, Canada. You're going to find it in upstate New York, Tennessee Valley, Montana, and northern Dakota, and I'm all over it. I'm talking to the senators and governors of all those states and provinces saying, look, let's take the Norway model. Let's take that exact footprint, what we got in Norway. It's already, you know, already being awarded coin. Put it beside the hydro dam. Then nobody can say, or the SEC can say, we need to audit that because there's no carbon, zero carbon. Now, I feel bad for the public mining companies that got the arrows in their back, but they didn't see this coming, but they're screwed. Now, you, maybe you don't believe in the ESG mandate, but you can't fight policy. Kevin, could Bitcoin move, Bitcoin mining become one of the primary incentives then to build out clean energy, change from this narrative of dirty energy to clean energy? Yeah, I think, I think at all of those facilities like Montana, like North Dakota, like Tennessee, the, the, the companies that are going into there that are willing to write those 100 to $300 million checks are saying, let us be part of the community. Here's a fact that even I didn't know, and I learned, and I'm so excited about. In the last 120 years, all the, the hydro dams built in America contemplated hydropower, but 90% of them never put the turbines in. So now you have an economic reason to re-turbinize them and get that energy to make coin, Ethereum, mine Ethereum, mine Bitcoin, build a data center, give energy to the community that never had it because the dam never had turbines, and become part of the community without any carbon audit risk. What's wrong with that? Like that, that is where Bitcoin mining can come out of the shithole it's in and say, hey, we're going to save the world in terms of new turbines for hydro. And that's just the hydro argument. 
I mean, th- there's a lot of upside here to turn the dialogue around, which is so negative. Like, wow, you know, I just say I'm mining Bitcoin, people spit at me. Like, it's just unbelievable. We had uh, Josh Wolf um, here talk about nuclear, and he brought up a good point at the end and said, listen, most countries, there's a shift around, nuclear has been taboo, but he said, look, a lot of countries might adopt it because at the end of the day, if you look at what China is doing, the country that can produce the most amount of energy most efficiently will come out ahead. It can produce more tanks. It can produce more. If Bitcoin becomes this sort of global reserve currency, I don't know if you agree with that or not, uh, but if it does, then there is this added incentive to find and support more renewable forms and efficient forms of energy uh, in a more efficient way. Nuclear stands out as one. Uh, There's also this idea of unutilized energy uh, that a lot of Bitcoin miners are attaching themselves to to mine Bitcoin. So do you think that there will be this shift in narrative in the US? You talk to regulators a lot. When you see what China is doing on a nuclear standpoint, I mean, they're going full bore out and building all these reactors and Europe is kind of shutting it down except France. Uh, the US has kind of been slow to, to move in this direction. But I'm curious um, if you think that uh, regulators are kind of getting that, especially now given like the, the crisis that we're seeing with Ukraine. If they are getting it, I think you're right. I think nuclear is going to be the next generation again. The country that's really getting it, that you can measure on a macro basis is the United Arab Emirates building a massive uh, data center around nuclear power, 100% green, uh, 600 megawatts. That's mm-hmm. massive. Um, and you know the, what people don't know about that country is they were very early in investing in, in chip and global foundries. And so they have access to the semiconductors no one else has. They're leading the world on this kind of idea. But I think we're going to start to see the same thing stateside. There's nothing wrong with nuclear power. It's safer than it's ever been. It's totally green. Um, we're going to need it, but you're right. And again, the economics, the private sector, when you look at the returns on Bitcoin mining around sustainable green energy, like the turbine example we talked about with dams, this is why Bitcoin over the next two to three years could turn around in terms of public perception. You know, even Texas with experimental wind and solar and this idea of green hydrogen, which is unproven yet, could really change the game. Bitcoin, because it has an economic incentive past 50000 on reward or a coin, really can bring a lot of private capital to this market that governments alone can't do. Mm-hmm. And so I agree with you. Uh, it, it's, it's, we're at the, the low. We're, this is the vilification mm-hmm. quarter of Bitcoin. And I think for those of us that believe in it and starting to invest in you know, the Norway model, for example, for me and others, um, this is a great turnaround. You have to see the darkness of the storm before you see the light. So it's kind of fun to listen to that dialogue. <laughs> but then you've got data centers themselves. The new oil is data. So everybody wants, you know, if you think about the Ukrainian situation, what it proved to the world is if I'm building a digital economy, which every economy has to get to, do I want my data centers on foreign soil? I don't think so. I want to build my data centers on my domestic soil so that all the accounts of my citizens are, are nexus with me, where I can protect it with security and protect it as a government. And, and the governments that have hydro are at a huge advantage or nuclear power so that I've got my, you know, my digital economy, I've got my data center recording it and keeping a block ledger on it, and I'm powering it with nuclear hydro. That's the future. Yeah. Kevin, I want to wrap it with one last question here unless Santiago unless you have anything else no I think you're gonna go for it yep cool um non-crypto question for you Kevin the Biden administration has signaled that they're looking to place this minimum tax on households worth more than 100 million this includes taxing unrealized cap gains I want to get your take on this what do you think un-American insane never going to happen crazy, very, 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 very bad idea. That would just crush capital deployment. I mean, this guy needs new advisors. That was unbelievably bad as a concept. What made America great? Why did people immigrate here, including me? To get access to capital and markets and take risk and create jobs and businesses that buoyed the most powerful economy on earth. And now we want to tax them for their success. 
That's the definition of insanity. That is the worst idea I've ever heard, and it's never going to happen. Now, look, I'm a big fan of the president and what he did on getting things organized around the pandemic, and that's whatever. But this is an un-American idea, a very, very bad idea, and one that would kill the essence of what makes America great. I mean, that is insane. And the chance of that happening is zero, because what I predict is going to happen in the midterms, not because of just this idea, but the more you table insanity like this, the more you hurt the, the, the essence of every American that believes in the American dream, the idea of starting a company in your family, building it up and providing freedom for your family, and then being penalized for even thinking about doing that. I don't care what party you're in. I predict he gets decimated in the midterms Mm. and as a result can't pass any policy and we won't be dealing with this until the next general election. Mm. This is an insane idea and I have never heard such a bad idea ever. Mm. This is the worst idea I've ever heard and it's 100% un-American. And Kevin, just a quick follow-up to that. Do you think the U.S. is losing its competitiveness? We talk about Silicon Valley being a hub. It's produced the most amount of value in the in internet, second, second to that China probably. But do you feel that the U.S. is losing its ground with these type of policies? Um, and especially in crypto, it feels like a lot of teams are, and maybe ones your investors investing in are overseas. Um, and, and, and does that concern regulators? You know... I think the, 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 the rapid onset of bills coming from the bipartisan senators, the, the Loomis bill is bipartisan. You got Ted Cruz in there along with some very powerful Democrats, which is extraordinary these days in anything to get some bipartisan support. But I think they're realizing they don't want to fall behind in innovation. This is the internet in the 90s. There's a lot of innovation and we got to keep it domestic. And everybody knows around the world that if policy comes out of the US, it'll become the standard. Um, you're right. The, the, the hardest hands over keyboards, the strongest, smartest hands are in crypto and blockchain. And, and they're all offshore right now because they're scared to come here and work because there's no policy. Many of them are Americans like Sam Bankman Fried, who should be working on U.S. soil. And I, I mean, I know he wants to come home, but he's got to get policy. So it, it's sort of we're at that transitional zone. We're still the greatest economy on Earth. We're still the most innovative, the most entrepreneurial. China is a repressive society. I think that has a cost long term. I still say if you took nine out of 10 entrepreneurs in any country on earth, where would they want to be? They want to be in America. And so I'm pretty comfortable. Sure, they love their home countries, but they don't have policy like the U.S. has. And the great thing about U.S. policy, it self-corrects. When we talk about something like taxing success, as you just mentioned, it self-corrects. It never lets that insanity happen. It just fixes itself because we have a democracy. So that's a bad idea and it will be treated that way and it'll be snuffed out. It'll never happen. And that's, that's the balance, the great check and balance of the American democracy, which everybody that lives here and, and supports, I mean, I don't have a problem paying taxes at all. I believe in the, in the system, but I don't want to be singled out as a villain for being successful. And I don't think that's going to happen. And I, I think that's why you got to speak out. You know, we, we have this right in America to speak what we think, and that shouldn't be taken away either. And so you may not like the message, but you have to tolerate it because we believe in free speech and we self-correct on stupid ideas. I don't mean stupid. I mean bad. Well, maybe in that case, stupid. But it's it's stupid and bad, but I don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> yeah. Well, Mr. Wonfos, it's so great to have you. You're such an inspiration for me. Uh, you know, just growing up watching Shark Tank, and so thank you for coming on the show, sharing your insights. I think dialogue and conversations like this are important, and everybody should understand the opportunity. Um, it's it's a wonderful time to be in this space because it's so nascent and so early, and there's so many opportunities. But it's not going away, and it's not it, it's it's only going to the moon. That's what's going to happen. Love it. What an ending. Mr. Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, We will see you next time on Empire. Thanks again for coming on. Thank you. Take care.